country in New York City. Victoria is an author of 11 books, a best-selling author. She's been on Oprah twice. Uh, she has an amazing, uh, her latest book is called Main Street Vegan. She's got another one coming out. She was named Vegan of the Year in 2012. She lost 60 plus pounds years ago when she became a vegan and she's kept it off. Um, she's She's an amazing woman and she's got all these projects going on. So she's not only a writer, but an activist and a coach. And so I'm going to just let you fill us in, Victoria, on your on your story and how you got to where you are today. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. It's so much fun to see you. <laughs> you too. So often when I do these, I'm meeting somebody for the first time, but you I actually know in real life and three dimensions. Yeah, so we met, Victoria and I met in 2008 when my first book, Excuse Me, Your Soulmate is Waiting, came out and she gave me a blurb and I went to her book signing and we've been friends ever since. So, and I've right. followed her amazing unfoldment into this new, new career. Well, the girlfriend thing, you just can't beat it. Yeah. Well, I've written my whole life. I like a lot of people have all these gifts and talents and they have to pick which one. I have one, which I feel is a great blessing to not have to pick. I do words. I, I'm a speaker and I'm a writer and that's what I've always been. So I started writing for a publication when I was 14. At that time I was writing for teen magazines and I got to meet the various rock groups of the era up to and including the Beatles. And then as I changed my diet, which I did for several reasons, I had always had a weight problem and I always loved animals and it came together over time that when I got my act together about my compulsive eating, I was also able to have choice about what I would eat and I chose vegan because to me it really seems like it covers all the bases. It's sort of like yoga. When I first got into yoga, I loved it because it was the only exercise I'd ever heard of that let me bring my soul along. And being vegan is the same way. It's not some kind of diet. There's no restriction involved. It's a way to open up your life to love for all creatures and to having all kinds of amazing experiences, meeting wonderful people. And it's really uh, given me a life beyond my wildest dreams. Oh, yeah, it's interesting because sometimes if I'm going to be eating somewhere, or people will be with me and they'll say, oh, well, can you eat that? Or is there anything you can eat? And it's not a question of can it's a question of choice, really. Exactly. You know. So. I always tell people, you know, I don't have a cat at this point. I, I have a wonderful dog named Forbes. But when I used to have cats, their food was never very appealing. It always smelled really funky. Never once in my whole life, even when I was a practicing binge eater who would eat almost anything, Never did I ever want the cat food. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, when I look at these foods that I choose not to eat, it is about as appealing as cat food. That's not food to me anymore. I eat these other foods. So I eat what I call in Main Street Vegan, the five fitness food groups, which are fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds. And if you just say it that way, it sounds so boring. But when you put it together, you get the incredible, incredible ethnic cuisines of around the world, yes. Ethiopian, Thai, Chinese, Japanese, Indian, Italian, Mexican, all of them have such wonderful, wonderful plant-based foods. And then you also get these beautiful, brilliant colors. I mean, I'm very much into juicing and smoothies and great big salads in the summer and in what I call beans and greens in the colder season where it's basically a big salad but you heat it up. And it just, I tell my people, when you choose your foods or when you look at your plate, you want it to look like a Christmas tree, mostly green with splashes of other bright colors. And it just gives you so much vitality that you go out in the world with the sense of purpose, the sense of power that I sure didn't have when I was eating the standard American diet 
or when I started to change my diet, but I was mostly eating brown foods. I don't know if you remember that era when anybody who wanted to be healthy ate kind of brown rice and brown <laughs> bread and nut loaf. Cardboards. And yeah. It was all fine, but it wasn't vital and vibrant and alive. And when you get in some of that lively stuff, your life gets pretty lively too. Exactly. And look how vibrant we are. You know, we're both over 50. So, you know, we're really... Um, so many people now, I had a family member in the hospital uh, recently with uh, diverticulitis, and once that happened, I was talking to other people, they'd say, well, what happened? And I'd say diverticulitis, and I, every single person said, oh, been there, done that, or oh my God, my mother or my friend or my husband had that, so painful, and then it's something that I believe a big cause is the sad standard American diet where yeah. not enough fiber and for people who don't know what diverticulitis is, it's the colon when it gets the pockets from pushing, you know, maybe you're constipated, you're pushing and those pockets develop and then food or feces get stuck in those pockets and there's a horrible infection and you have to be on intravenous antibiotics. Some people that I know have had their part of their colons removed mm. um, really bad and, and a, a high you know, animal product, animal based diet is not going to be good for the digestive tract. No, not at all. And when we think about what a lot of people eat on the standard American diet, it's animal foods which have no fiber and processed carbohydrates which have no fiber. Mm -hmm. And then people try to do better and so they bring in more vegetables and more fruits and maybe some whole grains and that's good. But it's still largely the fiber free animal products and, and some of these other things on the side. So when you get all the way into the plant kingdom, and it is true, these days we do have some vegan junk foods, and if you really, really want a vegan donut or cupcake or ice cream, it's all there. It's all so there. people say, oh, I could never be vegan because I could never give up you know, pizza. Well, now we can say, oh, you don't have to. There's wonderful vegan cheese that melts, day of cheese, you can put that on your pizza. And there's also wonderful, elegant French style cheeses, mm -hmm. companies like Treeline and, and Kite Hill and, and Miyoko's Kitchen. So we really don't have to give anything up, but when you choose to base your diet primarily on foods that grow up out of the ground and, and don't mess with them too much, you know, don't go into a, a lot of processing and, and too much uh, taking their parts away, you really end up with food that works with human physiology. Yes, exactly. And and just like you said, I loved how you said it's like a, Chris, you know, look at your plate like a Christmas tree and all the beautiful colors and you do feel vibrant. I make my juice every day and I, you know, beets. So sometimes I'll make beet as the base. It'll be beautiful red and other times carrot or, you know, the beautiful green apple or whatever. And it's just amazing. And so yeah, I mostly juice greens. I love yeah, greens. Yeah, I mostly do um, greens. Lemonade. But at the last Olympics, the athletes there reported that beet juice seemed to give an edge. The people who had the beet juice seemed to get just that little extra second, which when you're an Olympic athlete really means something. <laughs> That's right. One second counts. So what, what would you say, you know, your book is Main Street Vegan. Um, that's like your trademark. Now, what is a Main Street Vegan? Uh -huh. Main Street Vegan is a regular person who wants to live an extraordinary life. Many people are motivated, as I was originally and still am, by concern for these other creatures. I mean, I personally love animals, but I had a vegan say to me once, I don't love animals, I hate cruelty. And I think you could come from either point of view on that. Mm -hmm. Some people come to this strictly for their own health. Uh, this is the only way of eating and living that has been shown to reverse coronary disease, which is the number one killer of both women and men in the Western world. And some people nowadays are being motivated by environmental concerns, which is probably the biggest issue of all. Yeah. But it's so interesting when you think about the environment, it just seems so overwhelming. And the problems are so enormous that you can think about the suffering of an animal or the clogging of your own arteries, and that's more personal. But the fact is, the environmental issues are, are huge. There's a wonderful film called Cowspiracy that talks about the, how animal agriculture, the way we do it these days, and in the numbers that animals are raised because the population is so large, is the number one cause of climate change. And that's not a figure that comes from PETA or somewhere. That comes from both the United Nations 
and the World Bank, as well as a host of reputable scientists. So this is a really smart way to do things for all concerned. Right. All the water that, that is wasted, all the seeping of the, you know, the, the waste from these animals have to go somewhere. And mm -hmm. the gases, methane, uh, going into the air from the cows. And, all, and plus, if you want to go from a health standard, I don't think people often realize the food that, let's say, the cows are, are fed, probably GMO uh, corn, you know, genetically modified foods, and then they they're injected with hormones and antibiotics. Uh, so yeah. all of this in the animal is transferred in the human. Plus, which I always think as a spiritual side to it, that fear, that terror uh, that the animal feels going to slaughter and being mistreated is uh, the secreted into their tissues and then eaten and brought into our bodies. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. And I think people who are sensitive can sense that more than, than most people can. And I think a lot of people are, are just misled. I think all of us are trying to do the best we can. I don't think I know anybody who's not trying to improve their diet mm -hmm. and, and, and live more sustainably. But the information just isn't out there in, in clear ways because so much of it is tainted by interests of, of various uh, corporate and, and interests of, of people who have something to sell but for example a lot of people say well I'll only eat humane meat but I feel that maybe 30 40 percent of the people that I know that eat animal products say they only eat you know the good kind or organic but only two to three percent of the animal products qualify mm -hmm. so I don't know where these people are getting all this food and it's very and expensive the organic meat very expensive I mean I was talking to a, a farmer who actually raises pigs and and she does it the the best way you could do it if if you believe that enslaving and and killing creatures can be good, but she said, "Oh, we can't afford our own pork tenderloin," which really <laughs> says a lot. Says a lot. But the other thing with the organic, you know, people are always, "Well, I eat grass fed beef." Well, that's good, and I'm sure that's better for you, and it's better for the animals. Grass fed beef probably have the least awful life before mm -hmm. slaughter. Of, of any other kind of, of animals, but environmentally, because it takes longer to bring them to market weight, they actually contribute more to climate change than the animals that, that go to the feedlot. So it, it's just, it's hard to do it well, yes. very hard to do it well. And I think that's because, spiritually speaking, we're at an evolutionary turning point. Now, we, most of us ate meat at some point in our lives, so did our parents. Lots of us had grandparents or great-grandparents who were farmers or ranchers. That's our, our heritage in this country, and that's all fine. But now we're here, mm -hmm. and we know about the suffering of these animals. We know what's happening to the planet. We know what's happening in our own bodies, and this health care crisis, which doesn't have to be such a crisis if we just don't eat ourselves into it, so it's time. It's time for a change. And we're so lucky to be here and be able to make choices that make us part of that. And can you just talk, you know, about, we talk about the animals, dairy. Uh, dairy is part of the whole <laughs> process and it's part of the veal, you know, that's where the veal, it's all tied in together. I mean, yeah, and, and it's, it's the, all a problem. And people I might think, think that's fine for the body and we get calcium and, and all that. So just speak a little bit about dairy. Sure. I, I think in, in, in terms of, of the ethics, if, if you get rid of, of chickens and eggs, you're doing a whole lot <laughs> for a whole lot of, of animals, not to mention yourself. But dairy, so many people say, well, you know, it does, doesn't hurt the cow to take the milk. But what they don't understand is that a cow is a mammal, just like a cat or a walrus or a reindeer or a giraffe or a human mother. So mammal females, mammalian females, give milk for their babies. We don't just give milk our whole lives because we happen to be able to lactate. We lactate when we've had a baby. Cows are no different. And this is such a shock, I think, to people who, who are raised in, in cities or, or the suburbs. They just never need cows and don't know that this is how it works. But this is absolutely how it works. So cows are impregnated by artificial insemination about once a year. And the baby is taken away shortly after birth. Sometimes they get to stay and get the colostrum. Sometimes in the very best organic farms, they might get to stay with the mom for a week or so. But they are separated to great, great sorrow and, and grief on behalf of, of the mother and the calf. 
Now, it's kind of interesting that we who are mothers have lots of things going on in life, and we've got a career, and we've got our volunteer work, and we've got our causes, and we love our children. But the idea of being separated from them, there's just nothing worse, even though we have all this other stuff going on in life. That cow has one thing. All a cow wants, and this is a quotation from Susie Costin of, of Farm Sanctuary, all a cow wants is a family, and she doesn't get it. So the baby calf leaves. If they need the baby girl for dairying, she'll be raised on an artificial milk substitute and then kept for the same cycle of impregnation and, and being milked artificially. These dairy cows get bouts of mastitis. Their udders become so swollen that even if the baby were allowed to nurse, very often they can't do it because the udders are so close to the ground. We've really created unnatural creatures and then always if, if the baby is a boy or if she's an unneeded little girl then uh, they go to slaughter they, they go to the market and they're sold either immediately for bob veal or, or they're kept a little bit longer uh, the veal crates have been phased out in, in many places and I think that is being phased out more which is a good thing um, but they're still raised for veal and it's just not a good life for anybody. And that would not be happening if we weren't taking the milk from the mom. Yes. It's just, it's devastating. Um, and speaking of, of cows and dairy, you have your first possibly feature film. Oh, yes. Coming, it's so exciting. <laughs> Miss Liberty. And it is the story of a cow who escapes a slaughterhouse. Yes. And she does. I'm putting up the links to your website and everything. Before we spoke, I went on there and I was listening to the soundtrack or the song. Oh, I was in tears. I was like going into the kitchen and getting some tea. I was like, ah. it oh, was so you. touching. That's a sanctuary song um, by Dr. Daniel Redwood, who, who lives up in Portland. And we're very, very happy to have the song. We're very happy to have Mary Lou Henner signed on at this point. Love uh, Mary Lou. Role. Yeah, very exciting. She'll, she'll play the lawyer who goes out to the Midwest to see what can be done about this cow situation. Uh, I've met Mary Lou a few times, and she is lovely. That's Isn't so exciting. she? Yes. And talk about somebody who's great on why we shouldn't be drinking milk. Yes. Because she actually stopped dairy products before she stopped other animal products for, for health reasons. She's a great anti-milk advocate and, mm -hmm. and vegan. So she's involved, as is Jean Bauer, who is the co-founder of Farm Sanctuary. He's our co-executive producer. And you know, when it's one animal, everybody relates. It doesn't matter what kind of diet they eat. In fact, there's a, a lovely young man that I met who actually worked in a slaughterhouse to get information for his thesis. And he said that one day in that area, a cow had escaped from another slaughterhouse. And they were sitting in the lunchroom and all the slaughter workers were cheering for the cow. These are people who kill cows. It's what they do. Yeah. But the idea that one of them could get out brought up that sort of victory of the spirit feeling that, that we all share. And that's what we want to do with Miss Liberty. We're not preaching any kind of animal rights message, but it is there very clearly for those who want to see it and more subtly for those who aren't yet looking for, for that message yeah. that this is a being. This is a being who happens to be a cow, just like your dog or your cat happens to be the species that, that they are. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite quotations comes from Mahavira, who's a saint in the Jain religion of India. He says, to every creature, her own life is very dear. Yes. And Miss Liberty has a real precious life, and the movie is fun and funny and for families and also for adults. And people say, well, is it animated? No, no, this is, this is real people. This is a family feature film that is going to be pretty spectacular. So oh, keep it up. I'm so excited. Yeah, and, and the story of, of, uh, of Miss Liberty is in your book, Main Street Vegan, too. When I, when I went to the, I think it was in there because I went to your book signing in uh, Hollywood and you read the story about her, talked about Well, her. no, that's actually a true story. Miss Liberty is fictional. Okay, She's so it's a true story about a cow that did, the, okay, her, yes. Yeah, the, the story in, in Main Street Vegan, and Main Street Vegan has lots of little chapters. I, it was very clear to me that people have been reading blogs and Twitter, and mm -hmm. <laughs> so we don't need to burden them with long chapters, but it covers every aspect of, of being vegan. Mm -hmm. And there are maybe 
four chapters, three or four out, out of the 40 chapters that do have to do with the animal issues. And I do close the one uh, about beef and, and uh, uh, that kind of meat with a story of a cow that I actually met near the end of her life. I visited a slaughterhouse. You can't really do that anymore. They keep them all closed up like Fort Knox because they're afraid of bad publicity. Yeah. But I was able to go to a slaughterhouse in, in southern Missouri, and, and at the end of the day, these cows were being led up the, the ramp to their death, and one had wanted nothing to do with it, and she just stopped. She was not going there, and the man whistled at her. And when I heard him do that, it was like, this is how he whistles to his dog when he goes home at night. And the dog loves him and trusts him. Uh -huh. And this cow kind of stopped and just looked at him like, are you sure? Uh -huh. Because there were screams and there were smells. I mean, it was really like entering a horror. But all those instincts were overridden by the fact that she trusted this man so I always tell her story when I speak, and some people don't like it. Some people say, well, I'm already a vegetarian. I'm already a vegan. It's not my fault, and I shouldn't have to hear about that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if there's just one person who doesn't know or doesn't understand, that person deserves to hear her story, and I believe that it's my responsibility to tell it. Yeah. Oh, I know it's heartbreaking, but it's things that we have to look at because, like, just as we don't realize where sometimes where the meat comes from it's all packaged nicely at the store and then we just just easy to buy and put on our plates and not thinking the backstory of how it got there so it well, is I important that's part I think of, of all of life and I think that those of us who are involved in, in a spiritual life or who just really really want to live a quality life I think we're invested in looking into backstories whether it has to do with people or animals or what's going on because if we can't really support it with our whole being, whether it, it's a, a food purchase, a, a clothing purchase, uh, something that we're going to pursue in life, it's got to work on every level. Mm -hmm. you now, I think there's a time in kind of spiritual immaturity when it's like, well, it doesn't matter if I can make some money or if it makes me look good. No, nothing else matters. Mm -hmm. But I think as we grow and mature, we come to see, you know what, all that stuff matters and it matters a whole heck of a lot. Yes. And something you're doing amazing is this academy that oh, you have. Yeah. You can actually train people and certify people to be a VLCE, which is a vegan lifestyle coach and educator. And I was on your website and I looked at th this list of things. You know, you go to New York and it's this five day certification and all of the amazing things that you learn and get to go do. I'm going to let you tell us about it. But I was like, I don't know if I'm have time to be a light vegan coach, but I would like to attend that academy for sure. Well, you get the certification. A lot of people just use it in their profession that they have now or use it for their own edification. But we have had people from eight countries. Mm -hmm. It's a boutique program. We can take no more than 16 people. Mm -hmm. And our instructors are absolutely top-notch. Uh, for example, the man who teaches our marketing class wrote the Shark Tank Jump Start Your Business book. He was oh. tapped by the Shark Tank to do that. He's now writing another book for them. He happens to be a vegan. Mm. He has a tattoo. They don't show this on the Shark Tank, but it says Pythagorean, which is what vegetarians were called before that word was coined because oh. Pythagoras, the great... Greek philosopher and mathematician was what we would today call a raw food vegan, a little bit of trivia, but we have wonderful, wonderful courses in, in nutrition. We have a cardiologist who does a, a health um, and, and nutrition class for us. We have registered dietitians. We have an animal rights lawyer. So we have a really top-notch faculty. And then we have wonderful field trips because New York City is a great vegan town. Yes. So we go to a, a fashion boutique that specializes in, in vegan coats. We go to a vegan shoe store, Moose Shoes. You now have a Moose Shoes in L.A. Oh, as fun. well. Look that so up. for um, cosmetics, obsessive compulsive, a little boutique that's all vegan. We go to a raw food market, an Indian spice shop. So there's just so much color and depth and richness that this is an experience. You know, there are lots of wonderful courses online and all sorts of ways that people can learn more about eating a plant exclusive diet and being healthy and all these things. This is an experience that changes people's lives, and I'm just so proud to be part of it. 
And speaking of vegan clothing, weren't you the model of a vegan line <laughs> recently? <laughs> yeah, this is so much fun because some spiritual teachers talk about every good desire will eventually be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And we think lots of times, well, that can't happen because, you know, that, that train left the station. But when I was a young girl, I just thought fashion, mag fashion models were, were goddesses. But I was dealing with being really overweight and having acne and other problems. Well, this month at the age of 64, I was chosen to be the cover model for a new cruelty-free online fashion magazine called La Fashionista Compassionista. And it was the biggest hoot. I have to tell you, Marla, the editors showed up in my apartment and they brought this really cute photographer with a British accent. So when I was a teenager, all fashion <laughs> photographers had British accents. It's like, oh, they found one just yes, for me. Darling. And we just took pictures. I got to wear wonderful clothing from a, a vegan designer, Lois Eastland, uh, beautiful, beautiful dresses. So that is a free subscription to the magazine if anybody's interested and they can subscribe at LAFC for La Fashionista Compassionista, LAFCNYC.com uh, and uh, then they can see these fun dresses which are very affordable and then they're very flattering, they make everybody look beautiful. That sounds amazing. So, yeah, when you think about having a vegan lifestyle or vegetarian, gosh, it encompasses so much of our lives because you want to look at the makeup and the the clothing and the lotions you're putting on and uh -huh. the food and, you know, so sometimes it seems overwhelming. But what are your tips for people who just maybe want to start dipping their toe in? Where yeah. should they start? Well, that's the thing. If you look at it as an adventure then you do want to explore all these things. And I think the most important thing is if you want to do this, you really can't do it wrong. Now, does that mean that maybe you won't make some mistakes? Does that mean you might cook something that isn't very good? <laughs> or you might want to try all of the vegan convenience foods and you might go a little bit overboard on some of the foods that maybe you need to keep in the treat category? Sure, this kind of thing can happen. But basically, you want to look at a day at a time. It's just like the alcoholics in, in AA. So whether you're deciding that you're just going to say cut out chickens and eggs, because if you're only going to do a little bit, that's really a lot, because that's where the most suffering is. If you can, can get rid of chicken and eggs, and that includes the hidden eggs and pancakes and muffins and things like that, you'll be having vegan versions of that. And just do that a day at a time for a month or three months and just let it settle. Let it be part of you and then pick another animal food that you want to get rid of and then just start having fun with some of this other stuff. I don't know anybody rich enough to throw out all their leather shoes or all their wool and people say, wool, that's just like a haircut. Well, actually it's not. If, if you uh, find out what they, they really do, the wool industry is, is not what we've always thought, it's just pretty cool, but you know, take your time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it took me 20 years to get rid of my last piece of wool, and I'm not saying it should take you that long, but if it does, you're on the path, and it's really the process that's the most important thing. You know, some people make these sweeping changes overnight. It's just like, oh my gosh, I saw this awful video. I know how bad this is for either the animals or for my health. I'm done. All yeah. the animal food's gone. Everything's gone. Great, but far better that you take your time and stick with it because a flash in the pan isn't going to help anybody. Sometimes when that happens, it's just this big shock after you see something and you cut it out, but then as time, it kind of dissipates and you forget uh -huh. those images. So then you're like, ah, but you're right. As you go slowly, I just one little quick story. I was driving from Portland to Seattle um, a few months ago and on the road, all of a sudden, uh, I, I saw these uh, little white fluffs or something sticking to my windshield and there was this smell and it's just this weird thing happening and I was like what is going on what are these white fluffs and what is that and I figured it out the truck in front of me was transporting I don't know how many hundreds of chickens Aww. and they and and they were just crammed in there and the, some of the 
feathers were and down were flying out and sticking to the car windshields. And I tell you that to see them sitting there peeking through, knowing what just they what they were going through. I mean, I was just choked up. I was in tears. I, my emotions were so I just it was so strong. Um, it was it was devastating. Um, so it's, it's in, yeah, interesting how whether you see it on a screen or a video or you have an experience like that, you wouldn't imagine that you'd see that, and that would just happen out of the blue. And it was just so uh, it had a real impact. Oh, I'm sure it did. Well, there's cruelty at, at every turn. The transportation is cruel, mm -hmm. the reproduction is cruel, the, the situation is cruel. So Victoria, before I let you go, just t give us a sneak peek into your new book that's coming out. Oh, thank you. It's The Good Karma Diet, Eat Gently, Feel Amazing, Age in Slow Motion. And it's already on Amazon and BN.com. The pub date is May 19th. And what I tried to do with the Good Karma Diet was bring things up a notch. Because with Main Street Vegan, I really wanted that gate to be open very, very wide so that anybody who wanted to embark on this lifestyle could totally come through with perfect ease. The first recipe in, in the book, there's a recipe at the end of, of each chapter, is, is my mother's wacky cake, which was something that women came up with during World War II when eggs and butter were rationed. So this is not a health food, but it's the idea that if you want a birthday cake for your kid that's like everybody else's birthday cake, you can do it and still be vegan. And we do talk about health in that book. There's a chapter on juicing, but in the Good Karma Diet, we really bring it up. It's like, okay, we've got this two-part thing going on. You do good to others, meaning that you make cruelty-free choices. You make choices that uplift others and, and support all life. You are going to get some perks. Your life is going to get better. In fact, included in the Good Karma Diet are stories of 17 vegans who talk about how their lives changed when they changed their diet. And sometimes it's what you'd expect. They lost weight. They overcame a health problem. But others, the stories are just incredible about being able to fall in love. One woman is a novelist. She said she got over writer's block when she finally let go of dairy. Fascinating, fascinating stories. But then the other part of the good karma is that when you're feeding your body this food that is as beautiful as you yourself wish to be, that's exactly what's going to happen. It's simple cause and effect. Wonderful. I can't wait to read it. Thank you. Victoria, thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom and your beautiful light with everybody. And uh, we'll talk again when your book comes out. I would love that. Thanks, Marla. Bye. Bye.